This call for divestment spread across the country, from church groups to unions, but especially on college campuses. There was no way one could turn away from the struggle in South Africa during that time, during that period, because so much was happening and it was in the face. You couldn't ignore it. We need to convince the Board of Trustees diverse from the companies that do business with South Africa. Columbia's response to that was to say, thank you very much, but we're not going to do that. And I said, I can't believe all of you. You know, people in South Africa are dying. You are justifying supporting apartheid. And a majority of their trustees were on boards of these companies who were doing business in South Africa. So there was a real link to Columbia and the companies that were helping to support and institutionalize apartheid. And you have to respond. You have to respond to that. <laughs> The blockade the entrance to the main administration building of Columbia College, which was then called Hamilton Hall. We planned it for the anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King April 4th, 1968. So we also made the connection to that movement. The university has taken a firm position and has gotten a court order barring the demonstrations. The violation of the order is punishable by fine or jail or both. It's in your best interest to leave this area. And we were adamant if South Africa is not a sovereign state, and we use sovereign's name, <laughs> Colombia couldn't be a sovereign. University. Columbia University students say they will defy a court order to end their protest against the, the student school. blockade at Columbia University went into its 10th day. Demonstrators at Columbia University are calling for a citywide march on the university tomorrow. We did have the beginning feelings of a movement, and there was something that was happening, and it was around freedom and equality and ending oppression, and it, be, it gave the sense of what are we going to do to be part of it. The students at Columbia University have provided us with a lead, a lead that we have to follow. The outpouring around the country is tremendous. Time after time, people have come here to talk to us at Columbia to tell us your struggle has started struggle everywhere else. More than 100 students were arrested tonight at Cornell University campus after taking over the school administration building. 200 anti-apartheid protesters resumed that occupation at Cornell today. Police resumed arresting them tonight. We have to accept everything on your terms. Do we have to accept everything in your terms? No, I think that's a little bit. It sounds that way. No, it does sound that way. It sounds very much that way. Purdue University police arrested 22 people who refused to leave when their protest permit expired early this morning. At the University of Illinois, 60 students were arrested at a meeting of school trustees. Anti-apartheid protests at the University of California Berkeley campus have mobilized thousands of students this spring. Rallies in front of the administration building seemed a throwback to the free speech demonstrations of the 1960s. Berkeley students have a tradition of resistance to racism. South Africa needs the investment of the Western democracies led by America and the prestige of American universities. South Africa needs our investment for oxygen and our markets for carbon dioxide. The character of our nation is on trial. They will show patriotism by fighting for justice. Yeah.
there's a whole sense of uh, African American progressive political expression that had strong, unapologetic, courageous leaders who were actually making a difference. How can we wave the flag as Americans based upon our democratic ideals and embrace apartheid? I felt inspired and reminded of a, a, of a conscience, that I had a conscience, that I had a role to play. And I also felt a connection with South Africa. I stand here as a proud African woman, deeply concerned about my people. We were going to be part of this struggle. And so that's when we set up camp outside the president's office in the quad at, at Stanford. And people slept out there for weeks, making our moral witness around Stanford cutting its ties to any companies that were investing in South Africa. Hundreds of colleges and universities like Harvard and Yale refused to divest. We believe that uh, the approach we're taking, which is the, the more difficult one of one-on-one -on -one dialogue and trying to make our own judgments, is more consistent than what we believe the people in South Africa in general uh, would like. Protesters are getting ready for bed and perhaps a run-in with campus police. But they're going to have to come in with crowbars, you know, they're going to have to untangle people, they're going to have to look like the police in South Africa to get us out of here. I was raised in the South Bronx, um, so I come from a background where I've seen a lot of injustice. The movement gave me a chance to do something about it. It was like a vehicle to be part of a progressive cycle of change. We felt a direct connection to the experiences of people in another country, in a country on the other side of the world. And so we drew a line from South Africa to Washington, D.C., to Stanford. Thank you for caring so much that you were prepared to jeopardize your grades and good degrees because you are saying that there are things that are perhaps more important. By the summer of 1985, dozens of universities had decided to divest, but Columbia and Stanford were not among them. The students hoped their tactics would force a showdown at a May 17th Regents meeting, where divestment was the topic of the day. And to those who fear that an American withdrawal would be followed by a chaos that would hurt black South Africans the most, one can only ask what they think is happening in South Africa now. I was getting ready to come back from school. I, I had moved back on campus, and I was walking down the street, and one of the other people who were in the coalition came up to me, I think it was Larry Townsend, and said, Hey, Tony, did you hear it? Did you hear it? Did you hear it? I said, what? what? <laughs> he said, Columbia divested. I, I thought it was a joke. <laughs> I really thought it was a joke. I said, no way, no way. Having said that, on some days you have this sense that what you can do can change the world and that you actually got an institution to move like that. Well, it did uh, accentuate the pressure on other uh, major universities, and they were not happy about that. An entity of Columbia's stature could actually take that step, then it gave less excuse to Stanford to not be able to do something. So I do believe that Columbia's divestment added momentum towards Stanford to get it to do the partial divestment that it ultimately did. The student protests were the biggest the nation had seen since the Vietnam War protests of the 1960s and succeeded in pulling hundreds of millions of dollars out of corporations doing business in South Africa. 